this morning. Glad to see everyone. I'm going to go through our announcements just as we're getting started and uh, getting ourselves ready to come into worship. It gives us like a nice little transition uh, of things. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's happening over the next few weeks. So if you're someone who likes to do stuff, we have stuff for you. And a lot of it's in the bulletin, if you happen to grab a bulletin or has been up on the screen. Uh, but just to give you kind of an idea of what's coming up, uh, this week we have the ladies' lunch, uh, the Operation Christmas Child uh, crafting. Um, I've walked by it. I don't, I don't craft. They've invited me. But uh, <laughs> I just kind of laugh and keep walking because even what they're doing is... Uh, Impressive. So uh, those things are happening. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, the book clubs and, and Bible studies and all that is also going on. But there are some big things coming up just to be aware of. Uh, Fall Fest uh, is in on the 1st, so that is coming uh, quickly. <coughs> and if you'd like to be a part of it, I'm sure you're still welcome to talk to uh, Pastor Daryl about that and how to fit in. Membership classes will be taking place next month. If uh, you would like to be a member or you want to go through the class and just see what membership entails, uh, we'll be doing that during the Sunday school hour uh, for the first two Sundays of November. We'll be meeting in the gym. Seems like there was one other thing. Oh, the uh, ladies' retreat uh, also coming up uh, there in November. And I know there's a lot of information out there and uh, I happen to get an in, so I know all the details going on. Uh, I would be very excited if I were a lady. Uh, I'm excited anyway just to kind of hear how all the things go for everyone, but that's coming up, and if you want more information, talk to my wife. Oh, yes, and... Uh, time change is coming. I, look... There's there's a lot of other things. There's oh there's voting coming, time change coming. I don't know where uh, all the things are, but no, it's all out there and you can find it. And uh, if you have lots of questions, clearly, I mean, you're welcome to come talk to me, and I will direct you to the person who answers questions. But uh, that said, let's pray as we uh, get ready for service this morning. Lord, we are thankful to come before you. And thankful that as we come to worship, we worship a God who is so merciful and gracious to us. A God who loves us so richly. Lord, you are I mean, beyond kind in how you treat us and care for us. That you would send your son to be our savior. And Lord, as we are thinking about that this morning, as we come to worship you, recognizing that we have a savior who, who truly loves us. Uh, not a Savior who is distant, but a Savior who is near. And we think, Lord, of a world that is in such need of the nearness of its creator, the nearness of the one who truly loves and seeks its salvation. Lord, we praise you and give you thanks this morning. I ask that you bless our time. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, church. If you've been waiting for me to be done teaching Sunday school, to start coming back to Sunday school, that's next week. I finished, I finished this week, so my Sunday school series is over, so you guys can start coming back to Sunday school. That's, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I hope that's not a reality for any of you. If it is, talk to Nathan. He'll, and he'll direct you to the person that can answer the questions that you have. <laughs> Please stand with us. We're not going to waste any more time. Our God is mighty to save. Hmm. That's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He 
can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Oh, my life, you have been so, so good. 
Father, I do thank you um, for your goodness. Um, God, I thank you for the fact that there is absolutely nothing that can come between us and you. There's not a sin so great that can separate even the darkest soul from redeeming grace. Wherever we're at in our walk with you, Lord, I just I pray this morning that we surrender some, some of ourselves to you. Not just financially giving um, in praising you for your provisions for each one of us. God, but emotionally. God, mentally and spiritually as well. God, that we offer up our lives to you this morning. Um, that we give you everything. Um, because as far as friendships go, our friendship with Jesus is second to none. We thank you for that as we continue to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
think about the power of God um, and as we look um, at some of the things today it's amazing to me that God would, would use a person like me. I, I joke about being done with Sunday school but it was such a blessing to be able to teach about the apostles and to see how God works in our lives and we, when we faithfully walk with him there's nothing, there's nothing on this planet um, that can mimic that or mirror what God does for each one of us. Um, he truly is in charge of it all. Please stand with us as we sing Psalm 46 and prepare for the message. <laughs> at his feet he breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease almighty one of Israel you are on our side we walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire Oh, oh, oh. 
fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go with the Lord of hosts? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Father, it's amazing that no matter what happens on this planet, no matter what happens in our lives, there is 10,000 plus reasons to praise you. We can't even count how many ways. God, you bless each one of us. I thank you this morning that you've equipped each one of us to walk through these doors, ready to genuinely lift up our voices to you, to proclaim your truths, God, and to, to find peace, to find refuge, to find strength to move on. And God, as we open up your word, and as those living and active letters become life to each one of us this morning, God, I pray that you shape each one of us, that you mold us, that you make us into the people that you see us becoming, and that this not be just a regular Sunday routine, but a day where the God of the universe shaped our direction. We thank you and look forward to watching you work in Jesus' name. Amen. Our young people can be dismissed if you're between the ages of four and fourth grade. You're free to go. If you're not, I'm sorry. You're going to continue to stay here. I saw a lot of faces that got excited. Thank you, Jason. When I was in high school, I had an English teacher um, who, as I recall the class, didn't teach me a, a lot about English, uh, but taught me a lot about all the things that go with the study of English. Uh, I mean, it was high school, so we had hopefully by that point we'd learned our commas and capital letters and those kinds of things that we needed to do. And so he was focused much more on what do we do if you have all this information? What do you do with all this information? And one of the things in, in a class that he had talked about uh, as we were reading through something for the class, he was talking about the way we read as people. And uh, because it's the way we all read, chances are you do the same kind of thing too, is that we go through and our brains naturally, as it gets the idea of what's going on, it begins to kind of skim again until something interesting picks up. And uh, then we kind of read with more focus and intention. Oh, this is what's going on. And uh, until we hit a part that gets boring. And he was talking about that with us as students because it was a high school English class. So the books that we were reading were not exactly like exciting uh, kinds of things. Uh, there were very few sword fights and uh, things of interest to me at that time. But I remember them being like decent books. And he challenged us. He said, as you're going through and you find yourself hitting that part where you want to just skim, when your brain naturally says, this is the part to kind of skip down to the next time people are talking or whatever happened. He said, force yourself to read that part because that's probably where the author is putting something really important. And it ruined my life of reading. <laughs> because now I find myself, even however many years later, reading through something and kind of skimming and go, oh wait, there was probably something really important back there. And I go back and I read and I go, maybe there was something important in here. I don't know what it is. And then I have to read it and read it until I figure out what's important. All that to say, this morning, we're going to go to John chapter 2. And we're going to focus in at the very end of the chapter on something that's very easy to read over, uh, to just kind of skim, and we don't give ourselves time to give attention to it. And we're going to give ourselves time today to give attention to it, because this is a portion that we will benefit by ruminating on it a little bit by really giving some thought to what's happening and, and why is it happening and what is John communicating as a writer. As he's writing this down, what is it he's communicating with us? Now this is uh, the very end. We're just looking at verses 23, 24, and 25. This is a transition from all the stuff that happened in chapter 2 
uh, where we had we had Jesus turning water into wine, and then we had the Passover uh, feast, and uh, Pastor Rich had talked about things that went on there last week. And, and I, we're going to move into, we're going to get to chapter 3, uh, which is uh, very uh, famous because everyone paints John 3.16, you know, on stuff. And uh, we have Nicodemus, who's a really famous kind of character uh, person there. And so we're going to want to transition here, but it's really easy just to read over these and not think about what is going on here? What's happening? What is Jesus doing? And what does John want us to see that Jesus is doing? So let's pick up at verse 23 and just read these last few verses of the chapter. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. This is talking about Jesus. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, we're going to start. I was talking to my son as we were driving into church this morning. This is going to be a little bit of an unusual kind of sermon. Uh, I do have a three-point sermon inside of this sermon, but it's really toward the end. Uh, but I do have three points. If you're like, we're not going to get a three-point sermon, you're going to get two three-point sermons. Uh, but the really, the fun one is deep inside, and we got to work our way to get to that one. So I'm going to take you through three boring points uh, so we can get to the three exciting points. And then when we hit them, we're just going to go boom, boom, boom. But it's going to start off a little technical because John's starting off a little technical. So we're going to start with just this review a brief review that John gives us. as he, This is what's going on. And that's what John is doing here. Now, John, as a writer, from time to time, uh, will go back and he provides a summary of what took place and he comments on what, what was happening. And he's doing that because John is not writing fiction. If he were writing fiction, he could give it all to us the way you know, we would present something. But he's writing history and he's writing about stuff that happened. And so he'll write about the stuff that happened. And then occasionally he goes back and gives his own take on it, his own comment on it. Sometimes he goes back and he gives us a little information because he's concerned for us as readers that we might miss something. So if we go back into chapter 1, right, when John is uh, talking in John chapter 1, and he uh, brings out that the... <coughs> The uh, disciples, they start following Jesus, and uh, Jesus uh, says, why are you seeking me? This is in 137, and they said to Jesus, Rabbi, and then John gives us a little comment, which means teacher, because he wants us as readers to know what was going on. The disciples did not say to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher. That would be very awkward. And not a good sign if you're looking for a disciple. <laughs> so uh, John gives us these comments. Well, this portion in the end of chapter 2 is a similar kind of thing. Sometimes, and we'll see this as we go into chapter 3, he gives some longer comments as he's reflecting on what took place with Jesus. And this is the review he gives here in chapter 2. He just says, look... Uh, Jesus was at this Passover feast. I gave you a few of the events that happened there. There was the overturning of tables. There was this whole conversation about uh, prayer. And then there was a conversation about Jesus destroying the temple. But he wasn't really talking about the temple. He was talking about his body. And we just didn't understand that. And he gives us those. But now when he hits the review, he says, but there were a lot of things that took place there. And there were all these signs that were uh, being performed getting done. Jesus did a number of signs. Now, as we're thinking about that, we got to pause for a moment. Because John is a writer, he's doing something very specific with signs. And it's going to become really important to us later when we get to the good part of the sermon. So we're going to pause for just a second and talk about the signs. Remember in chapter 2 at the beginning, we're still in chapter 2, so it's not hard to remember, but at the beginning of chapter 2, when Jesus turned water into wine, if we go back to verse 11 and we read uh, what happened there, it says, this 
uh, the turning of the water into wine, the first of his signs. This is the first sign he did. He turned water into wine. Now hold on to that for a second. And turn forward to John chapter 4 at the end of the chapter, verse 54. Jesus was healing uh, someone there. It's not... There we go. Uh, Jesus uh, was, was healing... Um, nope, still... You all are doing good. All right, there we go. Jesus was healing... Uh, a son, official son, at the end of the chapter, verse 54, he says, this was now the second sign. So the first sign was turning water into wine. The second sign is when he heals the son. One sign, two sign. Uh, very easy to follow. Except what he says in this transition, where we're at in chapter two, at the end of chapter two, and he says, Jesus was at the Passover. And what did he say? He said, many believed in his name, name when they saw the signs he was doing. Now, now you see kind of maybe the issue. He's numbering the signs. Here's the first sign, and the second sign is still chapters away. But when he was at this Passover, he was doing signs too. Well, why weren't they numbers two, three, four, eight? I don't know. How does this work for John, and what's going on with the signs? tells us something is different here. So we want to know why doesn't uh, why not number the signs in between? We're going to talk about that, but the really, I think, bigger question is then what is he talking about here? Because he says he did signs at Jerusalem. These people saw it. They believed in the power of his name. And then he says, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. So what was going on? Why is why is John writing about this situation where there were signs happening and people believing, but Jesus not entrusting? What does that, what does that mean for us? And that's really the bigger question. What was happening here that Jesus would not entrust himself? And, like I said, from my English teacher, this is the place where when you're going through, your brain just kind of goes, okay, and let's get on to the next part because it's, uh, got some red letters in the next scene and uh, this Nicodemus and I'm excited about that and we gloss over stuff but that's not what we're going to do so let's talk about what was not happening what is not happening in this chapter or in this passage what is not happening if we just glance through it it might kind of seem concerning it may sound like Jesus is withholding salvation from these people. The people believe, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. They didn't get the thing that they needed. And the reason that it would seem that way to us as we're going through is that when we talk about believe, we think salvation. Because that's how we have access to salvation is through belief. And so we we kind of have trained ourselves believe Salvation. Here are people who are believing, but then they're not getting something. Is a thing they're not getting salvation. Did Jesus hold back saving them for some reason? And there's a lot of ways uh, that we, we do this and different ideas about maybe what's going on. Uh, idea number one is they only believed in the signs. So Jesus performed signs during the Passover. We don't know how many. We don't know what kinds. It's not important. What's important to understand is Jesus did something, and then these people believed in that. Well, one idea says maybe they were just believing in the signs. They weren't believing in Jesus. And so maybe that's what's going on here. And so Jesus didn't entrust himself to them because they weren't really trusting, believing in him. They were believing in signs. That's one idea. Another idea would be that they didn't actually believe in Jesus. They just acknowledged Jesus. And we know as we talk about it, when we bring up the gospel, and we talk about what Jesus has done, we need to believe in Jesus. That is, we have to have a trust in what he's done. That Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice for my sin. That's not something to just acknowledge. It's not an intellectual fact that I turn on or off. It's something that I'm actually trusting this person with saving me. 
And so maybe that's what's going on here is these people didn't actually trust Jesus. They, they just acknowledged him. They saw the signs and they said, oh, here's a guy who could do signs. And since that was their response, Jesus didn't entrust himself. Those are uh, probably the two most popular ideas. Regardless uh, of what we think, a lot of times when we just go through this quickly, we, we think somewhere there was some kind of superficiality in these people. And because of that, Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. Now, regardless, there's a big problem with both of these issues, with both these ideas. First problem is, what does the Bible say? What does John say? He says uh, in verse 23, uh, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. John is telling us these people believed. There's not a question of maybe they just acknowledged or maybe they kind of believed. It doesn't say they kind of believed. It doesn't say they thought well about Jesus but didn't believe. The passage says they believed in Jesus. So that eliminates that one idea and really brings a lot of question to the other idea about, well, maybe they were just trusting in signs. In fact, that idea comes up later because there's going to be a point later Jesus is talking to people and he says, look, look at the signs that I've been doing. If just for those signs, you should trust me, you should believe in me. And so saying here that, well, they were just believing the signs, Jesus wants them to just believe the signs. That if they believe the signs, they would know who he is. And so that doesn't work either. So this isn't what's happening. Jesus is not withholding from them. But it's a problem for us as we read through, and let me tell you why and give you some assurance with this. The concern, I think, and when we read this, and we read the statement that John makes that Jesus didn't entrust himself to them, if you're like me, we read it and we think, well, what if I'm in that same place? What if I believe in Jesus, but there's something wrong in me? And maybe I'm not savable. Maybe Jesus isn't going to entrust himself to me. That puts me in a very difficult place. But here's the truth in the assurance for us. There is nothing that makes Jesus save you in you. There's nothing in you that makes you savable. There's nothing in you that makes you worthy to stand before God. That is, he doesn't look at, at any two of us and go, well, this person is doing, you're this person, but there's a lot of names, so I'm not going to use all of your names. Uh, but, you know, this person is doing well. Uh, Daryl's doing very good, and I'm going to save him and Nathan. Oh, poor Nathan. I just wish I could save him. He's just not quite as good as Daryl. I've seen you run around a circle, Daryl. <laughs> At Awana. If Nathan could run like that, man, then I could save him. That's not how it works. There's nothing in us as we stand before God that makes us savable. There's nothing in any person. If we ever approach the Lord God and we think, oh, I have really got something and he has to save me, he has to do this for me because I'm a pretty swell person, we've completely missed what the Bible is telling us. So the assurance is there isn't anything good and savable. That's why it's by grace. I have nothing inside of me. That's the very reason I need salvation. It's the reason I need someone to save me. If I could do it myself, if I could get merit myself, if I could do the things that would make me worthy myself, I don't need someone to save me. I just need to do the right things. The fact that I am looking to Jesus for salvation is an admission that there is nothing in me that can accomplish that salvation. And that's the truth for all of us. Jesus saves by grace. It means it's not about what's in me. 
So if we read through this and we read it, we think, oh, here's a problem because maybe these people were somehow not savable. And so Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. And maybe then I'm in a situation where I am not savable. We're misunderstanding what's getting communicated to us. The truth is that Jesus Christ, though we're at the beginning of John's gospel, by the time we get to the end, we will understand Jesus Christ has died for all of us because all of us were found insufficient. All of us lacked what was necessary to stand before God. We were all in need and utter need. So Jesus Christ dies on the cross as the payment for our sins. He's buried. He was raised three days later, showing us my sac uh, the sacrifice Jesus made for my sin was paid for. And then if I'm trusting in him, I can have eternal life, not because of something in me, but because of what he has done. And that's it. So what is not happening in this passage is that here were people who believed in Jesus, but for some reason Jesus didn't save them. Not the case. All right, you ready for what is happening? Let's think about this. What is happening? We're going to bring it all together. First, let's go back to that issue of signs. Signs signify something. That's why the word sign exists. Now, uh, probably the most common sign it, uh, we see on a day-to-day -day basis is a speed limit sign. A speed limit sign has two things uh, that it's doing. One, it's communicating a truth to us. The speed limit here uh, is supposed to be, <laughs> right, or suggested to be. That's what I learned in driver's ed, that they all Im implied suggested to be, uh, which then I didn't understand. I mean, it's a suggestion. Suggested to be 35 miles an hour. And you'll say, where in St. George is the speed limit that slow? <laughs> you would be surprised. <laughs> but that's what the speed limit sign is communicating to us. But there's more that the sign is doing. The sign is also signifying something to us. It's telling us, representing something. It represents that there is an authority that oversees how fast people should go on this particular road. And there's an authority which can enforce that suggestion uh, whenever uh, it deems necessary to do so. So it communicates something, but it also signifies something. It's representative of something. And it's that, when we're reading in the Bible about signs, it's that representation issue that we're more concerned about. What's being signified? Well, uh, what's being signified here? The Gospel of John, he's focused on a number of things, but a particular truth right from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And John, in his uh, opening verses, he made a big case to show us that when he gets to Jesus, Jesus is not uh, just a man. He was a man, he was fully man, but he is also the word of God. And when he's talking about signs, the, the big signs, the ones he numbers, he's saying these were signs to signify that Jesus is, in fact, the word of God. He is the one in whom life is. So that when we get to the end of the gospel and we see that Jesus has died for us, we will understand that this was not just the death of another person. This is the sacrifice of our sin. This is the one in whom life dwells. This is the word of God. So he wants, to, he wants us to see some signs that he is pointing us that this is Jesus, the word of God. So he's highlighting those particular signs. Sign one, turning water into wine, was a revelation that Jesus is, in fact, God. He has the power over creation. He can turn this into that because he's God. But what happens in Passover, at the Passover feast, is Jesus does a number of signs. But they're not the signs that John wants to highlight that were just there to show that Jesus is God. They're signs to show something else. They're signifying something else. 
And that goes back to why is Jesus here? And Jesus was here in part as the Messiah for the Israelites. He has come to be their king. So though it's far off, not if you're shopping, but it's still a ways away, we're going to have Christmas eventually. We're celebrating Jesus has come. And we read in Matthew about how all the angels were there and they were praising God because here's the Messiah. And we read in Luke about how Mary and everyone else was so excited, but the angel says to Mary, this is the one who's going to reign. Right? The, Jesus is the Messiah. So he's going to be king over all the Jews. And while he is ministering on earth, it's this message he wants these Israelites to understand. He's the Messiah. So at Passover, he's performing all these signs. They're not signs to signify that he is the word of God. Uh, John is going to highlight those for us. But they are signs to signify he is the Messiah. So at Passover, Jesus is communicating he's the Messiah. Now that gives us a little bit more understanding of what's going on with the people. Because the people, they see those signs. Whatever things Jesus was doing to demonstrate his authority and his position as Messiah, these people saw it and they believed. They believed. So now we need to turn from signs to believing. We actually get the word believe here twice. Now, way back at the beginning of uh, our study in the Gospel of John, I challenged some I challenged all of you. I don't know if anyone took it. No one has shown me a Bible, and that's perfectly all right. But I said, when you come across the word believe, put a box around that. And so maybe if you did that, we have a box here. Because the people believed in Jesus. But you can actually put two boxes here. Because when it says that Jesus didn't entrust himself to them, that's also that word that's being translated entrust, same word. It's believe. Now, we're going to hear it very different, which is why the translators have translated it the way they have, because they're trying to communicate not just the words themselves, but they're trying to communicate the truth that those words are conveying. And it sounds very weird to us if we were to read it and say, these people saw a lot of signs that Jesus did, and they believed in him. But on his part, Jesus didn't believe in them. Because we use the word believe differently in different situations. And that might make it sound like Jesus was like, no one's there. <laughs> like, we believe in you, Jesus. And he says, no, you don't. Because you're not here. I don't believe in you. Well, that would be weird. But we also talk about the fact that belief means trust. And so it's easier and better for us maybe to read trust into both situations. The people saw the signs and they trusted Jesus. But Jesus on his part didn't trust them. He didn't entrust himself to them. <coughs> Same word, but it's about trust. Now, what was being signified? Well, what was being signified is that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what he's communicating. That's what everyone right now is concerned about in terms of history. Remember back in chapter 1 uh, when the disciples are first starting to come in? What do they tell each other? What does Andrew go and tell his brother? What does uh, Philip go and tell Nathaniel? We found the Messiah. This is what they're jazzed about. They want everyone to come and find the Messiah. So Jesus is signifying at Passover, I'm the Messiah. So what is it the people trusted? What is it they believed? They trusted that Jesus is the Messiah. They're saying this is, uh, he's making a claim. He's backing the claim up. I believe him. I trust the claim that he's making. This is the Messiah. So that's what they're believing. So what would it mean then that Jesus doesn't entrust himself to them? And John tells us why. He says because he knows, uh, he knows what's in them. He knows that they believe, and he knows what's in them. He doesn't need a witness. Now, Jesus needed a witness to demonstrate he was the Messiah. That's why he was doing the signs. 
Sometimes we need uh, cues to let us know who's what. So this morning, I dressed in a particular way to let you know this message. I'm taking it very seriously. <laughs> right? So you get a little cue. Hey, pastor's going to take this message pretty seriously today. Well, Jesus was the Messiah, but Messiah isn't something that is just obvious, so he needed signs uh, to demonstrate that. But when he gets to what he knows about people, he doesn't need a sign. He knows what's in them. I don't need anything that's going to kind of show me. I know what you're after. I know what you're doing. And what are they doing? They're trusting. He's the Messiah. Now, to think about why he didn't entrust himself to them, it's almost easier to think, what would have happened if he did? So here are a bunch of people who are believing in him and saying, this is the Messiah. And if he entrusted himself to them, they would have taken him, claimed he was king, and tried to institute the messianic kingdom right there. Jesus knows what's in them. That's what John is saying. He knows they believe. He knows that they're trusting in him. But he doesn't trust himself to them at this point. Because if he did, it would change the program. And he has something bigger for them to do. He has something bigger he wants them to understand. And so they're ready to go with this plan that they think they understand. And what they find out is that Jesus, our Jesus, is an interactive person. He's not a robot. He's got his own things going on. So now we come to the actual sermon in the sermon. Like That was the longest introduction uh, we've ever had. And it was. And I only have a few minutes now to give you the actual sermon. God is interactive. Jesus is interactive. It wasn't just these people looking at what, uh, who Jesus was, and Jesus says, okay, now you've got this, let's go. And there are some different reasons as we're thinking about you know, all the things in our life that we want to happen. Because we don't want only salvation. We want other things too. We want peace. We want blessings. We want healing. We want satisfaction. We want prosperity. We want maturity. And we want all these things that we should have in our relationship with God, but we want them now. But the truth is, and the application is, God has a different plan. God is interactive. He is not here just to satisfy our demands. So three things as we're thinking about this. God responds to the people and he responds to us. But the Lord Jesus and the Father respond to us with some things that we need to have a handle on, a grasp with. First, divine timing. The reason Jesus doesn't respond is because his hour has not yet come. It's not the time for it. It doesn't mean that they were wrong, and it doesn't mean that it's not good. It just means it's not the time. I may get up in the morning, and at 7.30 think, a bowl of ice cream is really a good idea. But it's not the time. It's not that ice cream is bad. It's that there's going to be a better time for it. So one concern, as Jesus interacts with us, He's concerned about timing. What is the best timing? Another is expectations. Because God has a plan. He has a plan for everything. It's his plan. But if God has a plan, that means God has his own intentions, he has his own goals, he has his own desires that he is also working out because he is a personal God. And so we come to God and we say, this is what seems good. Perhaps it is in prayer. Lord, I would like some 
blessing. I might like some uh, issue here resolved, some resolution to something. I would like uh, this prosperity. I would like maturity, whatever it happens to be that we're praying for. But we have to understand when we come to prayer, God is not a robotic response. God is also a person. And he may respond to us as Jesus is here with going, it is not the right time. Or with telling us, I understand you want that. I have a different plan in mind. I have something else going on that I need to make sure that's what gets accomplished. Because as God, he understands a whole scope of things I do not understand. And he's good. And so he's going to work all those things out. Which brings us to our third thing, which is uh, God responds to us with divine outcomes. In the case here of what's going on at, at Passover, the <coughs> divine outcome is that uh, there is going to be this issue of the kingdom. And he's going to talk about it. John doesn't talk about it in his gospel a lot, but we're going to run into it in just the next section as we deal with Nicodemus. Because this is the concern Nicodemus has, is about Jesus is going to come and be Messiah and king. So there's going to be a kingdom. And that's what Nicodemus wants to talk about. People want to bring that about. Well, Jesus is going to see that those things get fulfilled. There's going to be divine outcome. But he is going to accomplish more than only that. If he wanted to only do that, he could have come and set himself up as king and been king and reigned and been done. And that could have happened thousands of years ago, and the story could have been over. But Jesus was after more than just that. Jesus was after you. Jesus was after me. So Jesus, in his plan, he has his own intentions, but he also is going to see that there are outcomes which are divine in nature. They're the outcomes that he has planned. He's going to bring salvation to a greater number of people because in this moment, he doesn't entrust himself to these people. They're excited they see this seems to be the Messiah. We should go with this. We believe he is the Messiah. And yet we find Jesus does not entrust himself to them. Because in his plan for his outcomes, in his timing, he has something better. And what a reminder to us as we're coming to God, as we're uh, coming to the Lord in prayer, as we're seeking what he would do in our lives, as we're seeking what he would do in the lives of one another, to remember God is not a God who just robotically responds to us. He is a God of his own plans as well. And a God who is gracious to us, kind to us. A God who desires what is truly best not only for us, but for the world. Because Jesus loves you. Let's pray. Lord, we are very thankful as we are reminded in this chapter of the power of Jesus. Lord, here's the one who could turn water to wine. Here's the one who deserves our worship. Here's the one who will sacrifice himself on our behalf. Power and love. And Father, as we consider those things, as we think about what Jesus is after and what you're after in our lives, remind us that living life is a process. Lord, we see things uh, so uh, finitely, so immediately, that we miss a lot of the bigger picture things. But you have them all in hand. And Lord, we seek to trust you. 
Let us trust you, regardless of uh, how our plans might go. Let our trust reside in your son. And it's in his name that we are praying now. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, church, you guys want to stand with us as we leave this place? We're going to revisit what a friend we have in Jesus. And instead of focusing on the first two lines of verse two, we're going to focus on the last two. Verse three, instead of focusing on the first two lines, the part about us, we're going to be focusing on the parts about God, and then we'll just see what ends up happening. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Miss Church. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.